Hi guys, welcome to Cryptids Canada. I hope you're having a great Saturday. And if it's not a Saturday when you get to watch in this video, well then I hope it's a good day, whatever day it is. Well, spring has totally sprung in my backyard. I am a huge hummingbird fan, love to watch them. I could sit and stare at them all day. I have a couple of big feeders that I've filled up probably four times in the last week. Every single day I wake up and those feeders are laying on the ground or on the deck or on the table, but they're always empty. Now last year I think this happened one time, but if you'll remember, there was a, a black bear hanging around uh, for a day. I saw it in my backyard. So I assumed that he or she drank the nectar from the feeders, but it never happened again. So far, it's happened like four times this last week. So can somebody tell me what has a fondness for hummingbird nectar? I imagine everything would, but to actually climb up on something and knock it over? Does, I don't know. Skunks don't climb, do they? And I've never seen a raccoon, I don't think. Anyways, I know I should hang them up. I gotta go to the hardware store. But if you have any ideas of what could be getting into them in the meantime, I would appreciate it. Okay, guys, I've got a great story as per usual. So let's get to it. Hello. So this is the one and only time I am telling my encounter in its entirety. I seriously doubt I'll ever tell it again, but I'm not one to say, never say never, right? So I've noticed that the stories you tell on your channel seem to have quite a bit of detail. And to be honest, I think that's why your channel stands out. So I'm going to tell my story in that fashion and I hope that's the right thing to do. Okay. So I had married my girlfriend back in 1999. We were both 23. A month later, my grandfather passed away. My grandfather raised me because both of my parents were unfit and none of my aunts or uncles would take me in at five years old. They would have seen me in foster care instead. So my mother's father, my grandfather, took me and he homeschooled me till I was in junior high. Those early years were the most important, and he taught me everything about the forest, what was edible, what cured, and the list went on and on. I was taught to hunt with care and a kind heart. I would never take the life of something that I wouldn't eat. And when we fished, we always used barbless hooks, so that if it was a fish we couldn't keep, we could at least let it go without tearing its mouth up to set it free. Also, I was taught keep my hooks clean and sharp so as to cause as little pain as possible, and same with my arrows. So as much as I enjoyed spending all my time with my grandfather, I started showing interest in normal school and kids. I had no friends but my grandfather. So I was raised in Bella Coola, until junior high, or 10 years old or so. Then one day, my grandpa said, pack up your important belongings. Of course, I asked why, and he said, we're going to my other home, so you can go to school. Well, I couldn't backtrack fast enough, but even grandpa thought it was time. So we went to Lillooet, B.C. It was just as beautiful as Bella Coola, but it was bigger with more people and bigger stores as well. Also, more girls, lol. That's also where I learned Grandpa had money. And that besides the cabin, he had a nice home in Lillooet. So right away, they skipped me ahead two grades. And Grandpa said, no, that's enough. He's here for the social experience as well. So, as I mentioned, my grandfather passed away unexpectedly a month after I married my wife, and he left me everything. I was blown away by how much Grandpa had, but then the wolves came out. Long story short, Grandpa made it so that no one could get their hands on the money, 
including my wife. True colors came out, especially my wife's. She wanted a divorce because she thought she was entitled to a lot of it. I went to Bella Coola, where I was happiest, and felt closest to my grandfather. We had come back and forth over the years, so there really wasn't much to do to open the cabin. There was a few canned goods, but I needed to get some food in the house. I didn't want to go to the grocery store and see people that reminded me of my grandfather. It was a Saturday morning in May of 2003. As soon as it was light out, I went to hunt. I was going to try to get a few pheasants, but I was stupid because I broke the two most important rules. One, come prepared to protect myself first and foremost, and two, bring the proper weapon to make sure it was a fast and clean death for the animal. It was just a few pheasants, then, great, but I never considered the ravenous grizzly that were just out of their dens with their cubs, and I only brought a 12-gauge shotgun, which was perfect for a few pheasants, but probably wouldn't do much good for a raging mother bear. I was deep in painful distress, I missed my wife and never even realized she could be as cruel as she was behaving. So I followed a deer trail to a spot where Grandpa and I had shot some big pheasants a few years earlier. I was deep in thought, but then it occurred to me that there was something mimicking my steps. I made an excuse to stop, and whatever was walking beside me misstepped just by a few seconds. I knew there was something there. But I just couldn't see it. I came to the top of a dried-out river bank. The bank under my feet was eroded and hollowed out from the old river. There was a live tree that grew out sideways, out and over the bank. So I grabbed the branch and shimmied down the side of the bank, trying to catch sight of the stomper. But it had stopped, so I just dropped down the last four feet or so, and then... That's when I heard the low, threatening growl of a bear. I hadn't seen it yet, but the hair on the back of my neck prickled, and then the horrifying fear went straight up my spine. I turned my head slightly, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw the mother grizzly, who had been feeding her cubs. She was rolling onto her feet. I jumped up and grabbed onto the branch that I had just let go of and tried pulling myself up over the top of the river bank. I heard the grizz start growling ferociously and popping her jaws. I knew she was most likely running at the river bank trying to get to me. I was running as fast as I could. I knew the gun that I had wasn't big enough to take her down, not with as much fury as she was coming at me with but I knew she would soon get up that bank and she would be on me fast. I remembered the fallen tree that I had to sit on to swing my legs over it, and I thought I might be able to get off a couple shots to hopefully kill her before she got to me. Certainly not the fast and clean death that I was taught, but that was definitely not what I was thinking about in that moment. I saw the fallen tree about 20 or so yards up the path, I felt the ground shaking and I knew she was running after me. And then I heard a scream so intense it made my muscles seize. It took all the concentration I had to keep putting one step in front of the other. The scream was not that of the bear. It wasn't a growl. It was a deep and ferocious scream unlike anything I had ever heard before. I finally got to the log and I certainly didn't sit and swing my legs over it this time, like I did the first time. This time I dove over it, turned around and crouched down as I aimed my shotgun down the trail. It was only seconds, and then I heard the bear growl as she was breathing in and out, and then it made a sound as if she hit a brick wall. The growl stopped in mid-breath, and then I heard that same scream but this time I heard it also stop in mid-screen. At one point, I saw a flash of black fur, but it was just a flash. There was a violent fight taking place, and I couldn't imagine that it was two bears. I took that opportunity to run as fast as I could. I heard the moaning growl of the bear and the deep and powerful scream 
of what I just didn't know at that time. Both were breathing and panting as they pounded and scratched and bit and fought for their dear lives. I finally got to the cabin and I pulled out every weapon and loaded them on the table. I locked the doors and shut every door separating me from the many windows that could break easily. I sat at the table and I watched the living room window. Finally, I realized I couldn't hear the fight any longer. I looked in every direction and I didn't see anything. I opened the bedroom doors and looked out those windows. Nothing. I opened the door three inches or so and I just listened. I put a can of bear spray in my half unbuttoned shirt and grabbed whatever weapons I could and I jumped in my car. I drove to the home of a native man who was the best friend of my grandfather. I could barely stand, I was shaking so bad. He invited me in and listened as I told him what happened. He nodded his head and said one word, Sasquatch. I said, Bigfoot? And again he nodded. My grandfather told me that the native people of this land talked of Sasquatch being in the Bella Coola forests. My grandfather's friend told me he believed I accidentally came upon a bear fresh out of her den who was relaxing under the roots of the eroded river bed and probably scared her. And the Sasquatch who had been playing with me by walking beside me but just out of sight decided to protect me. He said that I had to go back and kill a deer, hang it in a high tree as an offering. And I said I couldn't go back. I felt like I would be killed. He invited me to stay at his house and he agreed to go hunting with me the next day in his woods and then help me hang the deer in a tree by my cabin. So we did just that. We hung the deer a good ten feet up a tree and way down a branch until the branch started to bend. He also said that we had to make sure the bear wasn't dead because we couldn't just leave cubs if she was dead. I said I would go if he got his brother to go with us. Safety in numbers, you know. But luckily all we saw was a spot about 20 feet round, all torn up. Broken branches and drops of blood. We got to the tree that I had used to climb down and we could see footprints of the bear and her little cubs walking away down the dry, sandy river bank. After I've calmed down, after calming down, I accepted that what happened to me was a blessing. And now I go to the old cabin once in a while and I appreciate all that my grandfather taught me. I hope my story's okay, even though I technically didn't see a Sasquatch. But I now have no doubt that I was spared that day because of one. Thank you for listening, Jason D. Wow, Jason, that story was amazing. I can't think of anything else that it could have been besides a Sasquatch. Another bear would have joined in the hunt. Um, definitely wouldn't have protected a human from, a, from another grizzly, for sure. Anyways, I uh, love the story. And I hope you guys loved it too. Please, before I let you go, do me a favor. Hit the bell for notifications. Hit the like button. I'm finding out it's more and more important to hit that like button than anything else. So, uh, yes, hit the like button and subscribe. Also, don't forget, leave me a comment because I love to read the comments. Okay, guys, you know I love ya. Have a great day and we'll see you back here in a day or two. Bye for now.